distance migrants. So we're really, so we're really going to uh, focus on those two species and that's what uh, our initiative is doing. So they both form really large colonies um, underground in caves, old mines, and the, the females from the northern populations of, in Mexico of both species migrate north in the spring to form maternity roost in northern Mexico and the southwest US. Then they return south in the late summer and fall. So there are populations of both species in central and southern Mexico that are, are not migratory. But the important thing is when they when they migrate north, they're following these um, uh, a nectar corridor, a sequential blooming of cactus and in some cases agave from the south to the north, and then following a nectar bloom south, uh, where, of course where they raise their young, and then uh, in the fall the young and the adults disperse again and move back south into Mexico, also following the bloom. The lesser long nosed bat on the left there is um, mostly moves north uh, in the spring on the coastal plain and Sierra Madre um, uh, Occidental. And it feeds a lot on columnar cactus while it's moving north. And then um, after they raise their young at the, the, in the south, southeastern Arizona and at least one site in southwest New Mexico, um, they move up in elevation and, and start later in the season feeding on agaves and then follow the agave bloom south. Now, lesser long nose, excuse me, the, is the Mexican long nose bat um, is a slightly more Eastern populations and they feed almost entirely on agave. There are a few other species, but they're very much reliant on agave. So they're following the agave bloom north and an agave bloom south. And uh, let's see, so the, the Mexican long-nosed bat was listed as endangered in the US and Mexico, or still is listed as endangered. The lesser long-nosed bat was delisted in 2018, though, um, you know, it, it probably should have just been downlisted. There's still a lot of uh, uh, stressors to those populations. But with the Mexican long-nosed bat, there are only 30 known roost between Mexico and the US. So. Um, we are looking at both bats, but there definitely is a little more focus on the Mexican long-nosed bat because of the endangerment issues and the, the drops in populations. Okay, so the threats to these bats, they're really, it's the usual suspects. You know, in the U.S., um, roost disturbance is uh, maybe down along the border is an issue, but uh, we've done a pretty good job in the last 20 years in the U.S. are protecting most of the major roost. Um, so probably probably the loss of foraging habitat like agave may be one of the primary threats to bats in the U.S. In Mexico, um, there is still a lot of issues with roost disturbance. Um, probably the biggest thing uh, overall in Mexico is conversion of natural habitats to, to uh, agriculture and cropland. Um, there's also misguided vampire control efforts in Mexico, um, you know, recreational impacts, vandalism of caves. So this, this may not be another reason why um, with fewer roosts, the Nivalis population is not doing as well. But in both cases, really loss of foraging habitat is certainly an issue. And again, this it's what really uh, uh, brought us to this, uh, uh, start this initiative. Um, Dr. Emma Gomez, who works out of the University in Nuevo Leon, um, did some research and she figured about 50% of the habitat for um, Nivalis, the Mexican longnose bat, has already been converted uh, to agriculture. Um, so, okay, agave, I think most of you know something about agave. It's a long lived monocot, it's native to Zurich and uh, dry tropical Americas. Mexico is the, the diversity center for uh, agave. There's over 150 species. Um, in Arizona and New Mexico, the two most important species uh, for bats are uh, agave palmeri followed by agave perii. They, they probably also use uh, desert eye and maybe shot eye. But um, you know, it's interesting because I remember when I was Looking into this, someone mentioned chrysantha. I get their name right, chrysanthemum. But as it turns out, you know that agave 
uh, produces most of its nectar in the daytime and is mostly pollinated by birds, moths, and other invertebrates. Uh, but both palmeri and parii produce most of their nectar at night when the bats would be, uh, be around. So, um, and of course, they reproduce by sending up uh, a large stalk with panicles and flowers. Uh, they put all the sugars into doing that. And, um, and then after the plant flowers, it dies, which is you know, why people call it the century plant. And it's that flower, uh, those flowers and that nectar is what the bats are after. The plant, the plant is after sex. It wants to be pollinated and the bats are after food. Um, they do reproduce by both seed and a lot of the agave also form clones, um, also called pups or offsets. Um, which of course are genetically identical to the parents. Um, and um, they've been used by humans for centuries, you know, in, in Mesoamerica for food, for fiber, for drink, um, and probably are best known even among us for uh, making mezcal and tequila. Um, and has that really has also a big direct and indirect set effect on the conservation of these species. I mentioned those threats. What I forgot to mention somehow was um, they uh, harvest wild agave for mezcal in Sonora and other places. Um, and of course they harvest plantation uh, agave for tequila um, before the stalk goes up because that's when it has the, the greatest amount of sugar and it's gonna uh, be best for making the alcohol. So um, there are definitely is threats to these bat populations where there's been a lot of harvest of, of wild agave. And, uh, and when there's been disease in the agave plantations because they're all clones and they've been hit hard, um, that sends people out more to uh, poach wild stock of agave. And again, they are slow reproducing plant. So this is, is definitely an issue. All right. Here's a, a just a quick, is that video showing okay? Yeah, it looks great, Dan. All right. So you can see uh, another thing about uh, uh, chiroptophily among plants is that the agave flowers are held upright, which makes it, this is the, the the mutualism between bats and, and plants that are pollinators. There's about 200 bats out of the 1400 species in the world that pollinate or eat fruit. Um, these are the only three in the US. And um, you can see how the flowers held up. So it's easy to get to, it's light colored. So the bats can see it when they get close. They're probably using smell at first and then eyesight when they get closer to the plant and it produces a lot of nectar. Palmeri, out of maybe 20 species around the border produces more nectar than, than, in the, than any of the others. And the perii produces a lot of nectar as well. Okay, and you know, here's, here's the, the tongue. They have the highly specialized tongue with kind of like a little brush on the tip. And the tongue is about half the body length and it's coiled up below the throat. If you can see on the left, that bat's face is covered with pollen um, something we'll, we'll mention is that these bats in a night can forage 40, 50, 60 kilometers. There's uh, bats, uh, a large Yerbabuene roost, lesser long-nosed bat uh, in the Pinacate wilderness south of Arizona. And those bats are recorded flying 200 miles a night. So they fly about 80 kilometers straight to the U.S. up by Saguaro National Park. And then they're trap lining saguaros and flying back in the morning. It's um, the few bats that have been uh, radio tracked have flown over 200 miles. We also recently, through pit tagging, a bat that one of our scientists um, tagged at a roost in Southern Baja showed up um, uh, up by Oregon Pipe National Monument. So these bats make really long distance movements. So they're moving that agave uh, across the landscapes. There's also a bat from the Boot Hill, New Mexico, that in about a week um, that had been pit tagged, showed up at a cave at Saguaro National Monument. So pretty, pretty amazing thing. Okay, and you know when they're when they're pregnant, when they're flying north, they're pregnant, and of course, uh, when they reach the U.S. and uh, are in maternity colonies, they're lactating. There's a lot of 
um, you know, a lot of physiological uh, demand for the female. So the, that high caloric content agave uh, and, and cactus nectar is really, really critical for the bats. So what are we doing? How are we doing going about this idea of restoring agave? And we are working both in the Southwest US, Sonora with partners in Sonora and uh, partners in Nuevo Leon and Coahuila uh, and further south in Mexico as well. Um, so seed collection. We work really closely with Borderlands Restoration out of Patagonia, as well as Gila Watershed Partnership out of Safford. Um, an agave palmeri, one agave palmeri can easily have over 100,000 seeds. So it doesn't take too long to uh, collect all the seeds you need to grow agaves. And germination rates are pretty high, uh, if you know what you're doing uh, in raising the agaves. Um, let's see what else. So uh, we contracted with Borderlands and Gila Watershed Partnership, and so far, We've plant, excuse me, we've raised about uh, 5,000 agaves. Um, about 80% of those have been palmeri because uh, most of the places we've been planting have been the uh, lower elevation. Um, and uh, again, pretty, pretty high germination rates. When they get to be about three years old, two to three years old, the plants are, are big enough for, for outplanting. They get hardened outdoors and um, the planting is really, really easy because uh, you don't have to dig too deep of a hole, which is great. Uh, about, about 10 inches, 12 inches deep and maybe eight to 12 inches across. Um, and where are we going to plant these? I'll talk more about planting in a bit. So raising them has not been too hard. And I should mention that uh, we checked with, you know, some of the agave gurus like Wendy uh, Hodgson at the Botanical Museum to, to make sure that, that we're planting and collecting uh, genetically appropriate plants for the regions that we're replanting. Interestingly, perii is pretty similar across the range genetically. There are some subspecies and some hybrids. Agaves do hybridize easily, but one of the thoughts of why that is, is uh, Native Americans and early people um, carry these agave clones uh, across the Southwest since they're an important food. All right, so, you know, when you're looking at millions and millions of acres, you have to kind of prioritize. So we put a 50 kilometer radius around the primary roost, um, the, the largest roost and the maternity roost in the southeastern Arizona, southwest New Mexico. So those were our priority planting areas. That 50 kilometers was an average taken on uh, the um, uh, nightly foraging radius out of the roost of these sites. Um, and then the other sites, uh, whether they're in a 50 kilometer radius or not, in areas that make sense as potential migratory pathways. And it's, it's actually really hard to radio track bats. There's only a couple people that will do it at night with planes. Um, uh, maybe one now, and um, the, the transmitters don't last that long. They have to be really small, just a couple grams, so they only last a couple weeks. There are geotags, but the point here is it's not like the uh, with birds, the Pacific Flyway, the Atlantic Flyway, um, and I know with a lot of the smaller um, passerines and neotropical migrants, people don't know a ton about their migratory pathways either, but definitely a lot more than bats because um, they migrate both in the daytime and at nighttime, but, but bats is just a nocturnal and over really rough country. So, um, so how many, um, you know, first it's, where are we going to put them? Um, there is some literature. I threw this up there. There was some very good work done, uh, out of the university of Arizona by Holly Ober. Um, and, and not a ton of work like this, but this, this made, uh, it was a good study. Um, and she had 3.6 agaves per hectare in the areas the bats were foraging versus 1.8 per hectare uh, for a random site. But that is something, you know, that we've struggled with a little bit when people say, well, how many do you have to plant? And uh, the other thing that's very difficult is to figure out how many agaves are on the landscape already. Um, one of the people that's done a really excellent job of that is Rachel Burke, 
who's the biologist now for the BLM in the La Cruces field office. She's an excellent biologist and she did her graduate work uh, with Catherine Stoner out of Colorado State uh, on agaves and she's kind of a dynamo. She, uh, well, the next slide will show you one of the species distribution models she did for agave. I believe she did them for close to a hundred species of agave. Um, but that's another thing that we can use to guide where to plant. But honestly, you know, also it's a practical thing. Where will people let you plant? So we've planned it with the Park Service, the BLM, uh, some with the Forest Service, and a lot of private lands because um, one is you want to focus on these these uh, uh, 50 kilometer buffers. Um, two, you know, you want it to be suitable habitat. Um, and three, where people will let you plant and where people will follow up and check on the plants, whether they need water or uh, so we can go back and monitor to see how they're doing. And, and someday, hopefully, to monitor how well they're being used by bats. And I say someday because I don't know if I mentioned it, but most agaves take seven to 25 years to flower. Uh, it's hard to get funding to study things long term. And this is definitely a long term project, but I think we're in it for the long haul. We're also trying to make sure that other people, um, where we plant the agaves, uh, there's a lot of partners on this project, will continue to, to monitor these agaves. I, I just mentioned that species distribution model. Um, this is work uh, by uh, uh, Rachel Burke and also uh, done by a couple other scientists too to look at potential nectar corridors, really based on um, density, and species richness of agaves, and then trying to map the bat, potential bat pathways onto that. So the planting for me has been like the most fun part. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we plant it with the National Park Service in the bottom left there, we're planting uh, with um, Freeport McMoran at three of their sites in Arizona. Um, you know, picture the scouts planting with borderlands restoration on their wildlife corridor. Um, it's just a, you know, it, it, what's interesting is I really don't see a downside. This should help the bats and other pollinators, but agave is not like going to go wild and take over and push out other native plants. Uh, so I think this is what we need to do to help the bats, but I just don't see it being one of those things where, um, you know, if people say, well, what happened? It, it, I don't see it having a downside at all. It'd be interesting to, to get feedback from other folks. Um, but, you know, they, they help, obviously, the bats, um, other invertebrate pollinators, they reduce erosion. Um, it's just a, it's a great project. So, and, you know, we've had a lot of really uh, fun uh, times planting God with people. I think there's a, a picture in here recently. Um, oh, this was just a, a picture of industry. We've come up with these agave restoration site signs and uh, a banner we had with Freeport McMoran. And uh, this was uh, a rescue operation when they were, so this is getting into the Grant County in Silver City. This was an, that expansion of the Chino mine. And we had Borderlands Restoration and Gila Watershed Partnership, and uh, and about 25 Freeport uh, employees showed up. I thought there might be five or six, and we managed to salvage 700 agave perii from the site that were gonna be destroyed as the pit expanded. And we got those over to Borderlands, Gila Watershed Partnership, and Freeport themselves to replant those in other areas, uh, preferably areas that they would help uh, help out the bats. And uh, I, you know, Emily, I was going to throw in a picture of you guys planting out there. This is at, at Delia Shoals at the Shoals' Bioresearch Ranch. Um, the Shoals were very foresighted. Uh, Delia, I know, is on the call. Her parents uh, got this property, I think, a long, quite a long time ago in the 70s. I can't imagine anybody else was doing this in the Southwest at that time and uh, preserve this land as a, as a research site and a conservation site. And this is up in the Palencios. And we plant it with the McGee's and the Loops just a few miles north of here, private landowners. So altogether, I think there was 150 planted at the Bioresearch Ranch and uh, probably 150 total, maybe 200 total with the Loops. Um, and again, this is the Palencio Mountains and North-South mountain chain that would uh, 
uh, definitely be a migratory pathway for the bats. I think all told now in the Southwest, in Arizona, New Mexico, we've planted about 4,000 agaves. Okay, now jumping over to, to Mexico. Um, so, you know, one thing is very different, as I mentioned. So you have the U.S. where, um, you know, we have pretty good environmental laws uh, relative to other countries, uh, some other countries. And, um, uh, you know, rooster service is not an issue. Uh, and agave, these, these two wild agaves are not used for uh, much in the way of uh, non just they're there as a, as a wild plant. So in Northeast Mexico, um, agaves again have been used for centuries for fiber, for making rope, for forage, for cows, for making pulque, for making um, mezcal, bacanora, you know, both uh, alcoholic products. Um, there's, there's ceremonial use of agave, erosion. So our project in Northeast Mexico it is not, agave is not used there, not as much. They're starting to for um, tequila or mezcal, um, but for these other uses. And this is also where the nursery, several nursery rooster caves of the endangered Mexican longnose bat. So there we're working with ajidos and it's really more of a land resilience, kind of a one health. So it's planting agaves, but also working on better grazing practices. Um, we are, and, and, and a restoration economy, we've helped facilitate uh, the construction of several greenhouses. I believe there's close to 20,000 agaves growing now with these nine ajidos, um, restored 200 hectares of, of land and, and counting. Uh, the slide says 9,000 agaves, I believe it's more by now. So it's been a really different thing. And we're working with, um, uh, an organization called ASHAC down there. I uh, uh, can't remember the, the acronym, I have it written down, but a great community-based conservation organization um, who also have uh, very good technology. They're uh, piloting some of the work to use drones to get a better idea of agave densities and distribution. And then in Sonora, Different, oh, that's just a picture of some of the, the viveros there in Northeast. In Sonora, um, Bacanora is mezcal that is grown in Sonora. And uh, both mezcal, Bacanora, tequila as well, they're all denomination control, you know, like champagne. Um, you can't just grow, uh, make mezcal from agave anywhere. Um, so anyway, in Sonora, uh, and it was illegal, Bacanora is mezcal made in Sonora. It was illegal until about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, for whatever reason. Um, it's made out of uh, agave agustifolia, which is also a bat pollinated agave. So um, through Borderlands Restoration, we met a Colectivo Sonora Silvestre, which was started as three, just a couple years ago, three young recent graduates from the University in, in Biology and Conservation in uh, Hermosillo. And man, these kids are just dynamos. Um, they recently got a $100,000 grant from the US to work with Bacanora growers, agave growers who are making Bacanora to uh, maintain hedgerows of plants that won't be harvested, that will go to seed, which then, um, will help the genetics of the plant for genetic diversity and also help the bats because all the plants won't be harvested. But it's also part of a, a, a bigger effort with uh, organic agriculture, um, you know, pesticide, water conservation, but they're working with the government and the government has agreed then to have a set of standards for the, for the growers that have to meet these standards and, and they will have to leave hedgerows, though most of them a lot of them have been uh, very much happy to, to join that program. So that's that was really neat to see um, these guys get things going there. There's also Cuenca Los Ojos, which was started by Valera, uh, used to be Valera Austin, now it's Valera Clark. Some of you know about the uh, Josiah Austin and Valera Clark's work in Southeastern Arizona. 
Um, she has about 200,000 acres of conservation lands along the Arizona, New Mexico border in, in Mexico. Um, and Cuenca Los Ojos is a conservation organization that uh, Valera founded. And Naturalia is a longtime conservation organization. They have a reserve called Los Fresnos, um, just south of the Huachucas in Arizona on the Mexico side. I think it's also along the San Pedro River on the Mexican part, and they're growing agaves with us as well. So how are we going to figure out if this is working? Um, there's a lot of different ways or how, you know, are agaves surviving? So I, I'll jump ahead in a minute and show us a, a quick slide. You know, the first thing that the, the agave part is easy if you can stay on top of it, which is getting out there to monitor and, and looking at survival, uh, taking good notes, no, noting, you know, where you planted elevation, soils, uh, moisture, and what kind of survivorship you're getting. Um, that's pretty straightforward. But making that tie in to the bats, and are you going to be able to show um, a, an effect of increasing agave numbers to increasing bat numbers or recovering the bat species? Well, at least in Arizona, and I think pretty soon New Mexico will do the same. Mallory can mention, you know, will we'll, we'll tell us. But there is a, a, for the first time in a long while, there's been standardized counts at all the roost. Um, to get an idea how the populations are doing since these bats do move across the landscape. Um, and uh, so camera traps, I know something Mallory was looking at was acoustic monitoring with a small acoustic monitoring device that picks up the, the echolocation of the bats. Um, and uh, as we mentioned before, you know, drones um, for trying to survey agave. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still, it's not gonna be an easy thing. Now, one of the most, Exciting things though, whoops, well, before I get to that, we're eDNA. This is just a quick slide to show you about all this planting. Um, this is an older slide, probably about a year ago. And on the left are maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10 sites. Um, and how many agaves we planted at these sites. These are all Arizona um, and what their survivorship was. The treatment, it says wire or rock, when we plant these, we always put a little rock mulch around the base of the plants. Um, that helps with condensation for water and it helps with keeping them warm as the rocks hold the moisture. This is something that was learned from, from the ancients, from uh, uh, Native Americans. And uh, um, if there's a lot of a javelina in the area, then we put down a, a, some metal fencing, a flat skirt of, of uh, metal mesh around the base also underneath the rocks to see if that will help uh, keep the javelinas off the plants. But the biggest issue has definitely been drought if they're not getting water. Um, remember these are little plants and, um, and then drought is compounded, you know, when there's nothing else for jackrabbits uh, or desert cottontails to eat, um, they're gonna eat agave as well as cows. Um, so, but where we've had good soils uh, good site conditions, and they've gotten either manual water or had rain, we've had up to 90% survival. Um, where we haven't, the, the uh, Coronado National Memorial planted 1,200 agaves in a big flat area, fairly compact soils. It was from that first border wall project uh, before the, the grand border wall project. And uh, in a sea of layman's love grass, and they were hammered by, you know, 25% survival, 75% uh, mortality because of uh, javelina and uh, probably desiccation as well. Um, but uh, talking to Beth Luke, who's on the call, and, and her husband, Ed, and um, others like the Palin Seals, um, drought may be an issue, moisture may be an issue, summer bivvery but there's probably enough healthy enough lion population where uh, there's not a high javelina population. But these are all things that we can learn. So here's the coolest thing to me. Um, and this is, I, I know people have heard about this, this is eDNA. So the idea then is sampling flowers, agave flowers, and you can batch them. You can go out and take flowers from 20 agaves and batch them 
and then check to see if they were visited by bats, if bats left DNA when they were foraging at the flowers. Um, this is in the experimental stage. I think Mallory had, might, and, and Mallory, will, hopefully you'll have a chance to get on and talk about this for a minute or two, um, is looking into this. I know Rachel Burke is interested and my, uh, my coworker, uh, Dr. Kristen Lear, is working on this now. That was uh, her project in the center there. They're collecting um, uh, agave flowers uh, from agave Harvariana over in uh, West Texas. Um, I should mention, uh, we'll talk about, finish up here in a few minutes about um, Lesser Lawnos bats in Grant County, the Silver City area, but the only known roost in New Mexico that has had uh, Mexican long-nosed bats is down in the boot hill, and it shares the roost with lesser long-nosed bats. So other than that, Big Bend is the only other roost in the U.S. for the Mexican long-nosed bat, Leptonychnus nivalis. Um, the bats that are in the Silver City area are Leptonychnus yerba buena, the same bats that are over in Arizona. So, and they're the ones that were delisted in 2018. Um, but this is something that has great promise. And, you know, if you can just go out and collect flowers and send them off to the lab and you'll find out if the bats have been there. So I think what Rachel Burke is interested in from the BLM is finding out, as well as BCI, you know, are Leptonychus nivalis also in southeastern New Mexico? Um, and you could spend days and days and months looking for old mines and caves or you can go out and sample flowers and send them off to the lab. So that's, that's pretty neat. All right. Um, so what have we learned so far? Um, well, agaves need water. Um, truthfully, once the agaves get older, you know, these two and three year old agaves we're putting out, they absolutely, we, we try and plant them during the monsoon or early in the monsoon. So we know they'll get water if there is a monsoon um, or at least in the cold season, you know, January, February, where there's less evapotranspiration, at least there used to be winter rains, they have a better chance of survival. Um, I think we're really gonna try and maybe make sure that if that is not the case, um, that we plant them in places somebody can get out there and water them a few times until they really can take hold. I mentioned the issue with predation um, and also uh, older, more robust plants do better. You know, um, I, I don't wanna say which nursery is doing a better job, but there are definitely different uh, techniques for raising the agaves. And some of the agaves that are being raised for us when they're at three years old from one nursery are a lot smaller than the other nursery. And we've had them talking to each other and seeing if they can we can, we can just get more uh, larger, more robust plants. Of course, we're gonna have a more robust root system and do a better job of survival. All right, let's finish up. Whoops, this was a picture I took. It was actually a joke of innovative predation reduction strategies. They happen to have this javelina target where we were planting with school kids over, well, hey, they're high schoolers. So this didn't, they didn't see this, <laughs> but uh, this is just a javelina target, just having fun, all right. All right, Grant County, what's going on with, with lesser lung nose bats in your area? Um, way back in 2000, Mary Kay Ramsey, who is a good bat biologist, an old friend, and she is the state t &E biologist for the BLM out of Albuquerque. She used to work for the Black Range Ranger District on the Gila. And uh, uh, being a bat biologist, she was wondering if there might be some leptos up that way. In 2001, there was a Leptonychus yerba. Well, the people didn't know at that time. The people that caught it uh, probably misidentified it. It was the lesser long nosed bat, yerba buena. Um, so Mary Kay kept looking and talking to people. And then in 2011, um, people in White Signal reported bats draining their hummingbird feeders at nights. So, um, and then in 2013, Debbie Beecher, who was a good bat biologist, has been working on leptonycters for many years out of, out of Tucson. Um, she was subcontracted by a, a consulting firm that really didn't know a whole lot about bats, but got a contract to see what was going on with leptonycters in that area. And they radio tracked a bat over to the uh, a leptonycters 
adult female caught at a hummingbird feeder in White Signal, and uh, they were able to radio track it to the west side of the burrows. Uh, there were a lot of old mines. It was a really difficult area to reach. They did not find the roost, but um, more documentation. And all this time, there were a lot of reports from people in CPAR and White Signal about their uh, hummingbird feeders getting drained. Um, and then in 2019, Keith Galuso from the University of Nebraska, who is, uh, was a UNM graduate, has done lots and lots of bat work over the years in southern New Mexico. Um, he captured several uh, bats out of Gila uh, mist netting and uh, at feeders, and mostly males, excuse me, mostly adult females, and uh, a few juveniles as well. Um, and uh, he, he really thought that these bats are probably, they, they may be moving into the area from the south. I should mention that prior to 2000, these bats were not known north of I-10. So this is, you know, when they started finding bats up around uh, uh, Grand County, excuse me, up around Silver City, CPAR White Signal, that was a pretty major range extension. The only other cave was down towards the big hatchets and the animus, uh, pretty far south in the boot heel. So um, there has been interest for a long time from New Mexico Game and Fish, Jim Stewart. And uh, fortunately, again, Rachel started working, uh, doing her graduate work in the boot heel and then was hired by the BLM. And so now um, uh, we have her in the area. Mallory uh, Davies, who's on this call, has been working down in the boot heel on bats. Um, and then we have our initiative. So there's a lot of interest in finding out a little more of what's going on with these bats. Um, so I think, I think there's an idea as to maybe start a citizen science program um, and get some hummingbird feeders monitored, um, also agave phenology. Um, and this was done, has been done for 10 years in the Tucson area. And they found some great information. When did the bats show up? When did they leave? Um, and they're able to uh, pair that with data from the National Phenology Network has a program called uh, Flowers for Bats, a science, uh, citizen science project where people record when their saguaros or their agaves are starting to flower. Um, and there's a rubric to how to do that. So it's all standardized and that information gets uh, put into the databases and then crunched. So um, the idea is, could we start something like this in Grant County? and start getting a better idea of what's going on with these bats. And um, if that gets going, you will hear about it. Um, uh, the type of people that are on this car call would be the, exactly the type of people that probably would have an interest in doing this and would be great at doing this. So um, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty neat. Um, so uh, along that line, and this was something Rachel mentioned that I hadn't thought of, we have, Right now, I just checked, we have 100 agave perii that are old enough to outplant, uh, not too far away in Safford, Arizona. And I will offer those uh, free to people that might have a good place. You can, uh, my email's at the end, or you can contact me through, through Megan or um, uh, Emily, uh, whatever's easiest. Uh, and, you know, Putting five here, five there, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to do, but we really would like to, you know, have a, a bigger patches. And when I mentioned that, I, one thing I forgot to mention about planting is um, our priority is definitely enhancing places where there are already agave, some agave, uh, because uh, the bats are already in that area. If you're going to go to kind of a new area without a lot of agave, you probably want to plant a really big patch, you know, a couple hundred agave or more over a few acres because, you know, these bats, they expend a lot of energy while they're foraging. So this optimal foraging theory, you, if you're going to spend all that energy foraging, you've got to get to a big patch. It's got to be worth it, you know, um, to make it worth your while. So, but we do have those Palmer eye will have more in, excuse me, the peri eye, um, which are slightly higher, higher elevation and probably one of the agaves that the bats in Grant County are feeding on. Um, and, you know, we will have more as well in the future. Um, the Lukes were on the call. Uh, and we mentioned the bioresearch ranch. You know, we've planted 75, 100, 150 agaves at these sites. There are, were agaves there already. 
Um, and now we're creating these really nice, super rich, basically thinking of them as prey, you know, prey for the bats, prey patches or agave patches, nectar patches for these bats. So that's something that would be uh, available. And again, a lot of people have been involved. They mentioned Borderlands and Hilo Watershed Partnership. We've planted a bunch with the Mission Garden. Um, I think I mentioned most of these other people. Pima County has been involved. New Mexico State Land. So we planted 300 agaves, I believe total in the boot heel, which is not very much, but as you know, it's mostly private land there or like the Animus um, and, uh, or BLM. The BLM has been hesitant to plant agaves. I won't, I won't go there. I mean, if, if uh, now that Rachel's there, we might be able to get that changed. Um, but uh, there's been some resistance. Um, and, you know, there's people who feel that 100 years of grazing in grasslands has definitely reduced agave populations. Um, it's hard to prove it when you don't have the, the baseline data, but some of it is really... Uh, ecologically intuitive uh, based on what you see currently. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to plant more, but where we planted in the boot hill so far was in New Mexico State Lands Department um, and uh, these other folks. So that's it. I think we have at least 10 minutes for questions. I can stay late if we need to. Um, and actually Mallory, are you willing to, to uh, jump on for a second and talk about what you're doing, five minutes? Hey, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Mallory. I'm a PhD student based out of Colorado State University um, out of Catherine Stoner's lab, the same lab that Rachel was in. Um, and I'm currently doing my PhD research down here in the boot heel. And I'm studying the lesser longnose bat. And I'm currently monitoring for the Mexican longnose bat. Um, I took a few notes, that stuff that Dan said. So, um, the last detection we had of Mexican longnose bats in the boot heel, um, our roost site is on Big Hatchet Mountain. It was back in 2016. So we haven't had a detection yet, but we've been monitoring 2019, 2020, and now I have to send my samples in from 2021, so we don't know about this year yet. Um, hmm. uh, so my research is focusing on the trying to build a classifier to be able to use remote sensing images to determine where agave is across the landscape and when it's flowering. So we can easily map out flowering agave across the landscape. And then I'm also looking at the reasons why the bats actually come to New Mexico. Because as some of you have may noticed, they do hang out after the agave is done blooming and sometimes they appear before the agave even start. So we're cu curious as to what led them. Some research that's come out of my lab um, from Scarlett, a previous master's student, has found that a majority of their diet or that the insects are found in their diet that aren't incidentals. So they are foraging on insects. And some of the work I wanna do is see how much of their diet is insects. So I'm doing a lot of diet analysis work, um, a lot of climate work and nectar availability. So that phenology that Dan was talking about, I'm doing very intensely throughout the entire boot heel. And also recently I've been netting a lot in Silver City and down in Rodeo. And I'm more than open to do any areas between where um, bats have been seen visiting hummingbirds. Cause I'm trying to get as many pit tags out there as possible um, to see where they're going and when they're moving. Oh, and also I've been doing some of the eDNA work with Rachel. Um, I'm just mostly assisting her where we're helping Kristen Lear out of Faith Walker's lab at um, the university in Tucson. And uh, we are, for all the hummingbird feeders that I net at in Silver City, we do swabs the next morning to see if we could test that for eDNA to see the difference between Mexican longnose bat, Mexican long tongue bat, and um, the lesser longnose bat. And if we could just figure out, discern the difference between two of the species, then we can use it as a monitoring technique throughout New Mexico to see if Mexican longnose bat is foraging out here. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Mexican long tongue bat, and early on in the presentation, I mentioned to folks that you know this is another the third uh, purported migratory uh, nectar feeding bat, and um, similar to these other two, they're all all three are a northern extent of a South American family, the Phyllostomatids. But um, because they are 
in relatively small scattered colonies across the landscape in pretty rough country, um, you know, except for climate change, when we don't know what's going on, they seem to be doing okay. And did you say a faith is at uh, NAU, the genetics work? Oh, I think my you bad, said you sorry. Were no, 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 it's no problem. Hey, it's my, it's my, one of my alma mater, so. <laughs> oh, man. oh, also I can throw my email in the chat. Um, and if anybody has long-nosed bats or suspect that bats are draining their hummingbird feeders in the middle of the night, I'm here for another week and a half and I would love to come out and net at your hummingbird feeders. That's what I was gonna suggest. I was gonna say if you could get your information on up there because I see a lot of people uh, telling their story about their hummingbird feeders and uh, it's happening a lot here in Grand County. Um, and if you could just give us a little, um, a brief synopsis of what you do with the bats when you catch them, how you catch them and, and sort of how COVID has played into bat research these days, because that's an interesting part of it. Um, that would be great. So I'll cover the COVID first stuff, um, or COVID stuff first, sorry. Uh, so we have to, we have really strict COVID protocols. And um, for the state of New Mexico, I'm the only non-white, so we have a group saying white nose syndrome and we have a group saying COVID, but I'm the only non-disease bat ecologist who's allowed to actually currently net for bats and handle them. That's because of concerns for spillback or um, transfer of COVID from an infected person into the bat communities. And since bats in North America are suffering so much from white nose syndrome and from death by wind turbines for our migratory species um, that we thought introduction of COVID into the bat populations would just be absolutely devastating. So we take it very seriously. Um, we never net if we have a fever, which is good. Um, we wear N95 masks and a face shield. We have to change gloves between each bat and everyone that I work with has to be vaccinated. Um, so I would love to net at somebody's house with COVID. Um, if you are vaccinated, we would just have to keep a distance between us so that you weren't breathing on the bats and there was a risk of spillback. And I also always bring extra N95s to lend if people want to get up close and personal with the bats. Um, they make really little ones for the bats. I was just kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> that would be pretty silly. <laughs> um, and then, so when I'm netting, what I'll do, what I normally do is I set up a net right before sunset and I wait till it's actually pretty dark outside to open the nets. And I do that right around your hummingbird feeder or I can bring my own. Um, and then I set up a processing station away from the net. And what I get to do is when we catch a bat, hopefully we would, I will take the bat out of the net and um, I wear gloves and I'm very gentle. And the, the long nose bats are pretty cute because they just kind of hit the net and they just hang there. So they're pretty easy to get out of the net. They don't really struggle at all. They don't seem very stressed out by it. Um, and then we take body measurements, um, like their weight, we figure out what their gender is or sex. I mean, and um, what, and we age them based off of a joint in their bone and how fused it is. Um, and then I insert pit tags, which seems rather invasive, and it is. It is an invasive technique, but the bat seems to not mind it at all. In the moment, they're like, it's kind of like piercing an ear. In the moment, they don't like it but they get over it really fast. And then I feed them sugar water and they're all really nice and calm. It's very similar to how you would um, put one of those ARFID tags in your cat or dog so that the vet can scan them if they end up getting loose. And then after we hold them for a bit to make sure that their wound is healed where we put the pit tag in, uh, we release them back to the wild or just let them fly away. Did that cover it pretty well, Emily? I think that was a great synopsis, yeah, because I, I think a lot of people don't know what pit tags are. Um, so I think making the pet comparison is is uh, registers with a lot of people. So yeah, but that was wonderful. And go ahead before you forget to put your um, email over there if you didn't already. Oh yeah, I started typing it. it. <laughs> and then Dan, I know you had your email address on a slide, but if you could also put it in the chat, um, just to make sure just that did. everybody got it. Okay, yeah, great. I just did. Okay, I, think I can't see the whole chat, but um, we'll go ahead and take questions. I'll start with some of the ones that are that are in the chat. Um, and if anybody else wants to sort of just visually raise their hand on their screen or use the hand raise button, 
um, we can do some just questions verbally too. Um, so I did see um, a question that was sort of asking if this area in Pinos Altos and sort of um, this higher elevation area, if is it good for both um, Palmer's agave and Perry's agave? Um, what would you suggest, Dan? Oh, could you repeat that? I was reading, I'm sorry. And I see that oh, somebody had, no, it's interesting. I see somebody had bats at 6,500 feet at Pinos Altos. So that was- Right, it's, yeah. it's sort of right. along those lines. It's um, yeah. saying is, is Silver City area appropriate for both Perry's agave and Palmer's agave, or would one do better here than others? Uh, to cultivate. Palmer eye is probably better in the grassland and lower foothills of the mountains. Um, and Perry eye starts to come in kind of where the PJ or the 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 P, the pignon comes in. So uh, Perry eye is definitely harder, hardier, and uh, so you know it does better in cold weather. And so I'd say like. 4,000 feet and above, maybe four to five over there, then you can get away with Perry eye. Rachel uh, thought that both would do okay. Okay, great. Um, I see Betty Spence ask, uh, what do they eat when agave aren't blooming? And uh, Mallory touched on that with some of, they do eat some insects, um, but what other plants and I'll, I'll tack on to that question because I know the Suaros had an incredible year um, yeah. in around Tucson and I'm wondering if because I know they do they do feed on those but was there any as far as the um, detections of bats went did the Suaro bloom uh, have any effect on that? Um, I just would say that you know it's a it's a primary resource for bats in earlier in the spring in that part of Arizona. It is a major, and, and, and the other columnar cactus that extends uh, uh, Cardone and Oregon pipe as you go from Arizona south through the foothills of the mountains into, into Mexico. Um, that, that cactus bloom is very important in the spring for those bats. And um, interestingly, uh, Scott Richardson, who's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Tucson, who was, uh, you know, the, the person responsible for Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, Yerba Buena, he said there were years where saguaro bloom failed and the bats were still there and feeding. So he thought maybe they were must have been feeding on desert eye uh, agave. But it is a mystery to me, you know, it, can they just get by on a on hummingbird feeders, you know, up in that that area, Grant County, late in September, October, there are bats being found up there late in September, early October, when it, there really are very, very few agaves blooming. One of the other things that can be done, of course, is collecting the pollen from the bats that are caught and getting the, the, the pollen identified. Um, in Mexico, there are other plants. There's a morning glory family that's in a tree form that is very important for, for, for these bats. But, uh, but that's not something here, you know. Um, but they, they constantly surprise us. So it would be very interesting to find out if there's anything else. And I don't know how many insects, you know, does it take, right, to equal kilocaries of, of uh, nectar. So that's some of the things that people, I think, will be working on. Mallory, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I recently netted at a bat physiologist's house just last week. Hmm. And that is something that we will be working on next season. It's going to bring um, a machine down from Wyoming so we could put the bats in it and measure their breath. So that'll be really exciting. Very cool. Um, I do see some people talking about how they would like to um, get some of the plants that Dan mentioned that are available, the agave, um, the young agaves. So just remember that his email address, which is in the chat, um, is the one to uh, contact if you're interested in doing that. Let's see, um, looking at other questions. Some people have mentioned white signal. Seems like that's a pretty well-known, uh, a hot spot for bats. Um, I think that's most of the, Megan, if I've missed anything, or Dan, I know you've been looking at the chat, let me know if there's anything else over there. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask just on audio? You can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself if you'd like. Well, this is Megan here. I'm wondering about roost sites of the lesser long nose. Do we know much about the 
at? Where where are they roosting? Yeah, probably, um, you know, there's a lot of hard rock mines in the boroughs that are hard to get to. A lot of old mining districts up in the boroughs so, and, and in areas in the Gila. So that would, I would say, you know, 90%. Because I don't know, I don't think, I don't know much about the karst over there, but I don't know if there's a lot of caves. Um, yeah. There's certainly a lot of old mines. Um, and some of them are very hard to get to. And the other thing is, you know, um, sometimes they'll use roost as transient roost. So they'll just be there for a week or two. You know, bats that are migrating, they call it a migratory stopover site. Um, and somebody mentioned the bats, you know, creating a mess on the porch. Because, um, you know, they, they, uh, they leave splats. It's like a wet, you know, the, but, but, but insectivorous bats will roost at night for a couple hours on a porch and just and digest food. It's a feeding roost. I'm not sure if the, uh, if the leptos, leptos, they probably use a feeding roost too, because if you're flying a long way, you might want to rest and digest before you fly back the long distance back to your day roost, the cave or mine you're in for the day. Uh, Mallory might know, but, um, but anyway, I would, I would say really high probability it's a mine, an old, an old mine, if not a natural cave. Um, Mallory, I thought of a question. Um, can you, cause you told me recently the difference between the, the guano of insectivorous bats versus nectivorous bats. And it was, I, my mind was blown. I had no idea. So if you want to let us know. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. So um, sometimes if you're having bird feeder is getting during the middle of the night, it might just be a ringtail. Um, so I've had a lot of people send me pictures and then eventually they'll find a ringtail footprint somewhere nearby. Uh -huh. um, so to know that it's a bat, if you're living out of range and it might be really exciting research is you look for a splat is what we call it. And it looks a lot like bird poop, but it's yellow. That's because they're feeding on the nectar of agave. And so their their poop is rather watery since they're on a liquid diet. Um, and sometimes later in the season, it'll start to turn a little bit black, but it'll always have that yellow sheen around it as long as there's agave still flowering. Where insectivorous bats, they tend to have pellets as their guano and it looks more like rodent dung. Thank you. And I see that um, Ron had a question, which you you ch uh, chimed in on in the chat, but he was asking if the insects that bats feed on are mostly moths. Ronald is a bat expert. He's one of our local bat experts. So I'm um, sorry, moth expert. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Oh, yeah, go ahead. And I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I can't remember right now what the insect abundance was. I just remember that there were insects. Um, but if you send me your email, Ronald, I can send you the paper that was recently published on this that talks about the insects being found in the guano. On the, uh, on the flip side, there is a bat that has always been thought of to be entirely insectivorous, the pallid bat. And uh, which you know, specializes often in scorpions and centipedes. Um, it's very common in the in the southwestern U.S. A beautiful bat, and uh, now they've been recorded many times uh, eating pollen from agaves and other. Um, so they may actually be uh, moving pollen around. I don't think nectar because their 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 tongues aren't set up for that, unless they're just chewing on the whole flower. But that's kind of a neat thing too. Oops. I am just now, oh, I see that um, we have someone who has a question and I'm also going to click the button to allow participants to unmute them. So, oh no, it's already clicked. So people, if you, if you do wanna unmute to ask a question, feel free to go ahead and do that. But we'll start with um, Joanne Arroyo. Go ahead. Hi, this is so cool, I love this. I'm a biologist and I just moved here about seven months ago from um, Northern California. And um, I've got mostly bear grass and yucca on my property. I'm a, at, in Silver City, about 6,000 feet. I have five years. I'm really interested in helping with populations if possible. So I didn't know if this was the appropriate habitat that could uh, we could plant some agave in. 
So um, I'll take one thing that was interesting was, um, you know, and again, it was something Rachel mentioned and something I I certainly know about was the idea of, you know, things may be borderline suitable now, but with what's happening with climate change, maybe building some resilience in because um, animals ranges are shifting in the ocean on land. And uh, a lot of times it takes the plants longer to shift, not all, but certainly long lived plants, um, not as not as mobile. Um, so that, um, you know, again, the idea is it's not going to hurt anything. If it was take if, if we were to put 25 agaves on your property um, and these agaves will reproduce by clones and that stand may last, um, it may not be used for five years. It may not be used for 10 years, but it may be really important in 15 years. Um, if we have enough agaves, you know, and uh, uh, the, the, down the list of priority planting sites. So give me a shout and, you know, we'll look on a map at the location and look at how far it is from the other sites where the bats have been, been uh, recorded. And if we can get you some agaves to plant and, and uh, Emily will go out now. <laughs> so she's an expert now. Um, that would be, that would be a possibility. I don't make any promises only because, you know, you just never know, but definitely something worth looking into. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I will. I'm a member of uh, the Audubon Society as I came in. I feed hummingbirds, but nothing's draining overnight. So, okay. Uh, uh, but we definitely have, you know, lots and lots of hummingbirds at the right time. Uh, cool. So oh, that's great. I will check in with uh, Rachel Audubon Society with this. Thank you. And bet. thanks for what you're doing. It's so cool. You bet. Thank you. So we'll go to Don next and then we'll do a couple from the chat again. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just thinking another great collaborative project. If you have agaves that need to be planted, I think the Southwest New Mexico Audubon Society, Healing Native Plant Society could maybe work together as a conduit to, to get those agaves, to distribute those agaves, and to train folks on how to plant correctly those agaves. And it would be a great project for school kids, for, you know, for families. And um, I think both of our groups could really get into that. So great. that's, what I'm, we're, that's we're, what I'm thinking about. We're on. You know, we've done it with Tucson Audubon Society, uh, Jonathan over there, and, and it's been great. They've done a good job. So yeah, I think that sounds great. Let's stay in touch on that. Will do. For sure. So we've got just two more questions and we'll sort of um, try to wrap up at, at 7.15. Um, and then if anybody wants to, you know, stay on for after party, you can. Um, yeah. That's a burning question. Well, I guess I committed Dan to that now. <laughs> yeah, it's um, Friday. It's eight, it's eight o'clock where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dan wants to go. So let's beard. not commit to that. But, um, <laughs> Russ Kleinemann, who, well, I believe it's Russ Kleinemann, he asked, um, he's wondering if anybody's co-monitoring the presence of great horned owls, which predate bats. Yeah, so great horns will definitely, you know, um, great horns, Mexican spotted owls will eat bats for sure. Um, and, and barn owls, because barn owls often um, nest in, in uh, caves and mines. And, uh, but they almost always seem to need to get them at coming out of a roost, let's see if the roost has a small entrance because you know the bats are good flyers. They're probably more maneuverable than those raptors. Um, you know, I know for sure of situations where barn owls moved into a very large leptinectarous roost, uh, like you know fifty thousand leptinectarous in a very narrow mine at it. You know, the, the bats were all the way in the back where it opened up, and the barn owls. You know, the bats were abandoning the site. Um, I think. Uh, the state agency went in and, and made sure the eggs had an accident. <laughs> I won't say which state agency, but um, anyway, the, uh, uh, and then there's a nice video um, that was taken in the Huachucas of a Mexican spotted owl grabbing bats, um, leptinectorous longnose bats coming out of a, a fairly small cave entrance. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll, um, I think they're a deterrent to, you know, in other words, if there's a mine or a cave and a, and a, and a, 
um, they are territorial to owls, you know, and if they're hanging out near that entrance, the, the bats may not just not use that habitat. Ringtails as well are a predator, raccoons are a predator. And in the winter, uh, the bats that do hibernate, you know, they're shut down. So they're looking for sites where they feel more protected. You know, at maternity sites and warm sites, bats are active and they can at least flee, and get out. But if you're, if you're in torpor, you're shut down, you're an easy mark. So bats often will use a more difficult to access uh, microclimate or cave or mine when they're in torpor. Okay, the next question um, was actually maybe something Don could answer, um, which is just, we have this wonderful Silver Creek Botanical Garden in Silver City, it's all native plants. And somebody asked if we've ever thought about maintaining feeders there. Uh, yes, I just, uh, Alan asked that question and I just, I just uh, chatted with him personally. Um, you know, we have hundreds of species of native plants and including two species of agave and um, flowering plants, that is the best thing we can do for bats and other pollinators. So we have no um, plans of, of feeders. That would be, I think, a nightmare for us. <laughs> But we could add more agaves. It's a good idea, Wendy. <laughs> um, okay, that's it for questions. I do see a couple people from from Pinos Altos have talked about having their their feeders drained, so that's definitely worth keeping an eye out for, even at that high elevation. But um, both Mallory and Dan, can you please both say your email addresses for anybody who's not familiar with using the chat? You bet, and it's easy. It's it's just D Taylor D T A Y L O R at batcon, B-A-T-C-O-N dot org. So uh, bat conservation, not bat conservation, but batcon dot org. And um, my email is Mallory, M-A-L-L-O-R-Y dot Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S at colo state dot edu. Um, and then I wanted to like, bring up one thing about hummingbird feeders, because we've talked a lot about how the bats use that for food. Um, we've noticed that in Tucson, that the bats will stick around longer than they should drinking from the hummingbird feeders. And they kind of turn into what I, like, what I think of as town deer. So you know when you see deer in town and they're eating garbage, so there's no nutritional values. So they look really scraggly and not, not very healthy. So our bats start to do that as well, the long-nosed bats. Um, the sugar water and the nectar feeders doesn't have proper amino acids that they would get from the pollen and agave. So the bats stay out too long, it gets too cold for them, and they tend to not migrate south as soon as they could, and they might put themselves in a predicament where you no longer can migrate south because they lose the nectar corridor. We haven't been able to prove that's happening yet, but we have caught um, bats with really poor body condition in the winter time in Tucson. So if you have hummingbird feeders, I know the bats are drinking from it, it might be wise to slowly decrease the amount of nectar you leave out each night to, to encourage them to head south with the rest of their buddies. I think that is excellent final advice for tonight. Um, I do have something to say about that. I did a hummingbird study for 10 years in Tucson. So we had hummingbird feeders up for 10 years continuously in the season. And we, naturally we didn't want the bats draining them at night and they did. And what a very, very simple way we found to keep the bats out of your traps is to take simply um, concrete reinforcing wire, which is that six inch square wire, you know, that you can buy and roll anywhere and just surround your feeder with it. And the bats incredibly, even though those holes are six inches big, apparently it messes with their echolocation and they cannot get to the feeder. So that worked for us for 10 years using those cages to keep the bats away from the feeders. Susan, that's Just really saying. cool. I wonder if it's because um, so I've done like a lot of slow mo recording of the bats of the hummingbird feeders, and they kind of knock into it, and then they lick the um, nectar off the sides of the feeder. That's why they make such a mess because um, the holes aren't actually big enough for them to get their tongues in there. Right. Have, exactly. Yeah. If you have Oriole feeders, they can get their tongues in, but hummingbird feeders, they can't. So I'm curious if like that barrier stopped them from being able to lap up the um, nectar as easily, or like hit their tongue and they didn't like it or something. 
Well, they didn't actually appear to, because we could notice when they hit the feeders, which they did constantly, they didn't appear to go through the wires. They didn't oh. actually get to the feeders. We, we couldn't, we didn't ever do a study of why, because we were just happy that it worked. But the feeder was about, I mean, the wire cage around a regular size feeder was about um, 18 inches in diameter, and it just hung around the feeder. So it doesn't, didn't have to be, that's just the size that we first started with and it worked. So um, if anyone wants to keep bats away from their feeders, that's the thing to use because it worked for us. Very cool. Bring in your can, I, can I bring up something else that if you're a hunter and your um, hummingbird feeders are being drained at night, maybe just bring the feeders in at night and then put them out in the morning. Well, in our case, of course, we had remote feeders, you know, out in Sabino Canyon and you can't bring them in at night. We had sites all over the Southwest. So we, we just had to have them caged. Yeah, that's very clever. And then just for homeowners, though, we could bring our feeders in at night. All right, thank you everybody for those those extra bits of um, expertise. I never, I'm always so impressed with everybody we have on these um, Zoom presentations because there's so much knowledge in the room. But we're at 7.20 now. I feel obliged to release our speakers who were so generous to do this presentation for us for free.